Hey, welcome back to another live Q&A session. I'm on my lunch break, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm just going to turn my camera on. If anybody wants to check in, I'll go post on the Facebook group that I'm on here, taking questions as soon as I can figure out. I guess I'll use that URL. Let's pop on over to the Facebook. Head into our Facebook group, the Radiologic Technologist Group. Post a little thing here. And a lot of Q and A during lunch. Say hi. Ask your questions. And I don't know if I have a thumbnail for that or not. Let's see if I could. I bet I could. I bet I could do that. Hey, say hi in the comments if you're on there. I see two. No, Siri, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> uh let's go back to no no siri but i'm but i'm just adding some thumbnail action here oh i didn't put the link in that's what i didn't do Duh. Copy. There it is. And pop over to a couple other of my favorite groups. There's Chris's group. Share. And let's try one more. Ice tea. Do, 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 do. Post. Good enough. Hey, Sheila E. Glad to see you. Hey, glad to see you too. I am so glad that I found this little ability to answer questions for everybody. Because I've been blogging my little brains out for two years, kind of answering questions that way. And, um, it's so hard to put it in words and say everything appropriately that it's much easier to do it this way. And it's, and it's kind of real time. I just wish, I wish we could have a two-way conversation. But um, good to see you too, Sheila. Allison, any strength training advice to prepare for this career? It's a little intimidating hearing about moving 300-pound patients. I posted on the group, but would like to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so there's a couple thoughts on that because like I just got one. In fact, I'm writing an article on uh, um, someone posted, is there heavy physical activity in radiology? And then they listed all these pro problems that they have with their back and their knee and their shoulder. And I, I'm writing the article and I'm just going to say, if you've got that many problems already, you're probably looking at the wrong field. And, um, Got the Santa beard almost done. Oh, I don't know if you can still got some yellow in it. I look like Smoker Santa, right? With this, but I got to I got to bleach it out a little bit more. I got a couple of gigs. I like to I like to run around town and play Santa for the kids. Uh, I don't I don't charge anything anymore. People ask me how much you want. I I don't like charging for it because I, it's I like to do it for fun. When you start charging people for stuff, it feels like work. So uh, anyway, got to bleach it out a little bit more, but um. The thing is about uh, patients, so, you know, the article I'm starting to write down all the different ways that we have to move patients. We have to, we have to go get patients um, 
from different locations in the hospital sometimes. They could be in wheelchairs or in gurneys. And if you have to bring them down in the gurney, then you've got to drop the rails and slide them over to your own table. And if you're on the night shift, you, you could be doing it by yourself. Um, you know, administration or a wiser technologist may tell you, don't do it yourself. Always get somebody else. But the fact is there may not always be somebody else. It may just be you, or you may be in a hurry, or, you know, you may have uh, patients waiting on you, or you may just feel like I can do this. It's not that big of a deal. I worked the night shift for 10 years and I moved just about everybody by myself. Now, if it was somebody really, really big, then I would call the ED or wherever that patient came from or, or, or stick my head out. If there was somebody else I could ask for lifting help, I would do that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for 400 pounders or something like that, but I'm 6'3", 290, so I could pull just about anything, which, which is probably another reason why they had me on the night shift, because I could work pretty much by myself. But there are tools you can use, like slide boards. Um, you get real good at rolling patients up on their side, lifting up the sheet underneath them and hold them up with that sheet, and you lay that slide board in underneath them, and then you, you slowly roll them back on that slide board, and then you just grab that slide board and pull it over. And that slide board, that's kind of like that thing you always see in the ambulances and on the TV shows, where they put the patient on their back and then they put their neck in the, in the uh, uh, constraint. Um, the backboard is kind of like a, the backboard in Ambos is a lot thicker. A slide board is a thin piece of, what is that, like polycarbonate something, I don't know. Uh, but it's super lightweight. You're always seeing them hanging on the walls in the x-ray departments and in the CT departments and in the ED. So use the tools that they give you to move large patients. Um, they also have something called a Hoyer lift. A Hoyer lift, um, if you're familiar with cars, is, is like a cherry picker, but it's just a, a big, um, uh, like a crane with a chain hanging down and uh, almost like a cloth uh, slide board or a cloth hammock. And so if you got a patient on a table that's laying on a table, you bring this crane over them and you, you lower it down, you roll the patient up on their side and you lay that hammock out and roll them back onto that hammock mechanism and then start to, dr to draw them up and hoist them up. And then you can actually move them with this crane. And so uh, it's been a big push for these Hoyer, H-O-Y-E-R, Hoyer lists over the past few years because studies have shown that um, even though those things are, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars maybe, um, the amount of money they save you in workman's comp issues and, and employees being out of work because of injury, it more than pays for itself. Uh, to buy a Hoyer lift, but not everybody has them. I, I, I've never, well, I've seen it used a couple of times, but I've never had one in my department. Um, I've asked, I've asked for them, but uh, you know how it is trying to ask for equipment. Um, so what can you do? So I've been looking at that actually, because there are ergonomic posters that you can, uh, that they have like for ultrasound. Ultrasound techs have an ergonomic poster that you can put on the back of a door and it shows, you know, the different kind of uh, stretches that you can do for ultrasound to uh, do the, the different um, so ultrasound techs throw out a lot of shoulders because they're always reaching over the patient, scanning with their hand. You, you have to reach over the other side of the body, scan into that left kidney, and you have to pinch the probe and do a lot of twisting. So you get a lot of carpal tunnel, a lot of elbow problems, and a lot of shoulder problems. So there's an ergonomic poster for ultrasound techs, but they don't make an ergonomic poster for x-ray techs. And that's another project I've been working on. But it's really kind of the basic things where, you know, you, you do uh, squats or lunges, things like that to strengthen your legs. You, you can do um, just normal weightlifting type or even body weight type exercises to keep your body in shape, push-ups and, and pull-ups and all that kind of stuff because you're, you're really using the same muscles that you do for, you know, regular daily activities. You're just overusing them sometimes pulling large patients around. So as far as strength training advice to prepare for the career, I, I would say the biggest thing is just stay in shape. Try not to get out of shape. Um, Cause that's what we're really, what we're really bad at it, it, as tech sometimes is we just work our butts off. And don't take time to stop and eat healthy. We, we go through and grab whatever is quick out of the cafeteria or the, the vending machines and drink soda and just, you know, whatever we got to do to get the food in. And then we get back to work um, because it's not that it's not that administration's on our back because they are. 
It's because we see our team that needs our help and the patients that need our help. And that's why we're in the job to begin with. So that's, that's probably the best I could tell you um, on strength training is just to stay in shape, uh, lift weights, do that kind of thing. Um, the injury, let's see. I, one of the repetitive motions I would do is I would put a patient on a table um, and have to slide them down into like the gantry, for example, in CT. And so when it comes time to pull them out, I would grab the sheets and pull, pull this way. And if, if, you, if you're leaning forward and pulling with your back, you can injure your lower back. If you're grabbing with your hands and pulling this way, it's a little easier on your back. Um, what you definitely don't want to do is be bending over to pick things up, to, to lift the patient up out of a wheelchair uh, or anything like that. You want to do everything as ergonomic as possible. So bend at the knees, not at the waist. And I think there's even studies that show um, pulling is better than pushing, but I, I can't remember. You'd have to look that one up. But when it comes to, of course, I'd look funny going backwards with a portable x-ray machine, but there is something to pushing versus pulling, but I don't quite remember what it was. And um, some hospitals are getting real fancy now and they have gurneys that are automated and you can just kind of like your portable x-ray machines, you just grab the handles and drive that gurney. So I hope that helps you out. Uh, have a great day, Allison. I'll see you over on the Facebook group. Anybody else on there have a question? Okay. I'm going to, going to um, mute for a little bit then and work on some stuff here on the computer. And I'll watch for comments to pop up. Um, I think uh, I did see um, I did see a video where someone was talking about x-ray and a question was posed about starting IVs and the question was you know I, I want to go into x-ray but I don't like starting IVs do I do I have to start IVs in the x-ray biz and the answer is absolutely um, that's not the answer that was given on the other channel um, the, you're taught how to do IVs, uh, or venipuncture to be specific, um, in x-ray school, because almost every modality that I can think of minus maybe ultrasound, um, and they actually do an air bubble contrast, but, um, that's completely different. X-ray techs are taught how to put, uh, needles in mostly in the form of butterfly needles, because of a couple things one it's easier to learn than starting an iv um the butter you know the little butterfly needles it's like a straight needle with two little wings coming off of both sides and has that squiggly tubing coming off of it and x-ray schools teach you how to do those not to draw blood because that that's what they're mainly used for in the laboratory they use butterfly needles um, for hard to stick veins for one thing um but x-ray techs are taught to use those because when you put a butterfly needle into the vein, as soon as you break through the vein wall and you're into the lumen of the vessel, there's a little flash of red blood right at the very beginning of the clear tubing that comes off the butterfly. So when you stick a person, you know exactly when you're in the vein and when to stop pushing, stop advancing because you see that little flash of blood. And in, in some cases, you, you put that needle in, see the flash, stop advancing, tape it down, and you can use the other end of that squirrely with a syringe of contrast, and you can actually in, inject contrast through a butterfly needle. And MRI techs are very familiar with that uh, because they only give 10 to 15 milliliters of gadolinium when they, when they do their contrast studies, whereas, you know, CT has to push 100 a lot of times, um, and that's, you, you know, they make 100 cc's uh, syringes, but you can't do that in CT. You'd have to push consistently at a certain pressure. And, and that's why we have automated injectors for CT. Um, but in this, in this other uh, channel, somebody said, do I have to start IVs? And the person said, uh, x-ray tech should not start IVs. Um, and if they do, they should get paid more, more money. And I, I didn't say anything because what he's actually saying is kind of true in the fact that um, it's actually his, his opinion is what he's saying. 
if you're an x-ray tech and you're starting IVs, you're worth more in, in pay, in his opinion. But it is something you're actually taught how to do in school, and it's kind of hard to argue that I'm worth more because I learned something in school. You learn how to do x-rays in school, and you're not getting paid more to do x-rays. You're paid one wage to do everything you were taught in school. Um, so I, I bet what's going on in that situation is where that person works, there are nurses that are starting the IVs for the technologists. And sometimes that's the case, and you're lucky if that is the case, but that's not always true. Um, and then there are reasons behind that. There are two different reasons why you would want nurses to start IVs or you would want the technologists to start IVs. And one particular you know, situation, if you have a busy CT scanner, um, it's quicker to, to kind of stage the patients, meaning put them in a, in a pre-care, post-care uh, area where the nurses are and let the nurses get them ready for the exam, maybe change them into a gown if they need to, start the IV, flush it, get them ready. And then when the tech's done with the patient and sends them on their way, the nurse brings over the next one, puts them on the table, and then they're immediately ready to be hooked up to the injector and run. And the nurse is back starting the next patient. And you can do this continuous cycle. Whereas if you don't have those nurses, and some hospitals can't afford to have extra radiology nurses, some hospitals just have a radiology department and you have to use an ED nurse or a floor nurse to come help you with a difficult IV uh, stick. But in, the, in that other scenario, a tech has to go get the patient, change the, the patient's clothes, put them on the table, start the IV, scan them, take the IV out, and then send them on their way. And that takes you know, depending on how hard that stick is, that can take you an extra 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and if you're trying to turn and burn, if you had a high volume hospital, uh, you don't want to be wasting that much time on, on putting the IV in. And that's why they'll have nurses starting IVs and then you, you send the patient back. I said that a little bit wrong earlier. The nurse puts the IV in, puts them on the table, tech scans them and go back to the nurse to take the IV out. And then they're, then they're out the door. So the there's a lot of, you know, different people in that radiology department. There's, you may have an internal transporter that can run the patient all around for you. You may have uh, a registration type, scheduling type, front office type people that can do some of the transporting around. Um, sometimes the nurses do it. Sometimes the techs do it. So uh, when it comes to IVs, you, you absolutely could be asked to start IVs as an x-ray tech uh, and even more so for CT. And in fact, you're kind of worth more in terms of uh, value to the team if you can start your own IVs because uh, sometimes you need your nurses doing other things that techs can't do and you need the techs to, to do the, the IV starts while the nurses are focusing on some other care. Maybe they're, maybe they're in the IR lab uh, assisting with a procedure in there. Are you going to have your patient that needs a CT angio wait for the nurse to get done with the IR procedure to start the IV or are you just going to start it yourself? So just wanted to clear that up. You are expected to do IV sticks um, in x-ray. And, you know, there's less and less exams that require it now. There's, there's not very many left that you're having to do IV contrast for. And maybe at some point they'll go away completely thanks to CT. But um, if they're going to – they teach it in x-ray school. And if they teach it in x-ray school, you're – it's like vital signs. You're taught how to take blood pressures and – if, uh, if somebody asks you to take a blood pressure, are you going to say, no, I'm an x-ray tech, or are you going to jump in and help out, you know, especially if you're in a small hospital where they kind of rely on everybody to pitch in and help out. So I think, you know, in a bigger hospital where um, you have a lot of compartmentalization and you have a dedicated uh, nursing staff for radiology and that kind of thing, you know, you can, you can count on more help to start IVs and, and do things like that. But um, I don't want anybody – going into the field thinking that they won't have to do IVs because you, you definitely get trained and could be asked to start an IV. So um, any, any other questions out there before I mute the mic? Let's see what's going on over on the Facebook group. Ba -da, ba -da. A couple of people asking to join the group. Let's let them in. So there's Brooke. Uh, that one did not answer the question, so you're declined, and so is that one. If you don't answer the simple questions, uh, you don't get into the Facebook group. Um, that's just part of the deal. 
Anything else in there? Uh, for anybody, it's a little off topic, but uh, as a group, for any of you that uh, do the uh, weight loss stuff come January 1st, my wife and I have started a, a weight loss challenge on Diet Bet. It's a platform, if, if you haven't heard of them, Diet Bet uh, challenges you to put a, a bet, a wager down on uh, a certain uh, event. And if you meet the goals of that event, you you uh, split the pot with everybody else that met the goal. So we set a goal of 4% in four weeks of weight loss. And as long as you lose 4% in four weeks, all the people that meet that goal gets to split the uh, whatever the total pot is. So um, Lisa, for example, my wife, she started one a few days ago. And uh, it's a $100 bet. So it's a little bit high, but... Studies show the more you bet, the more uh, you'll stick to the program. If, if you don't have anything kind of – if you don't have any dogs in the fight, as they say, um, you're not as apt to stick with the program. But she's in one, and there's there was over 71 people last we looked, so that's 7100 bucks. And, um, you know, not everybody will finish. Uh, people will give up and quit and cheat, and and they make you weigh in and out uh, on on with images and secret – words that you put in the image and all that stuff so anyway last time i looked at one out of 70 people only about 40 finished so those 40 split that entire pot evenly so you come out with more in your pocket than you put in to begin with and of course that's not the point but it, it holds you accountable to the weight loss so if you want to get in on that you can find it over at the uh at the facebook group i've linked to it in the facebook group there's a link to the diet that event if you want to get in. It starts January 1st, goes four weeks, and uh, 4% is not a whole lot to lose, but it's a good start. Once you lose that 4%, then you, you get back in and you do another one and lose another 4%, and it kind of kind of steamrolls and keeps you going. So it's been a, a slow Monday with everything on my plate, and um, Siri just keeps thinking my phone and my watch. Siri is dying to talk to me today. All right. Well, I'm going to mute the mic and work on some stuff on my computer here. If you chime in and have any questions, put it in the comments section. I'll put that right here. Uh, I can type today. Or doesn't work, huh? So Allison's probably gone, but um, there there are usually quite a few people around, unless you're on the night shift, that you can ask. You can always ask your fellow X-ray techs and and CT and whoever's in the same kind of general corridor to help you. You commonly hear a moving help or lifting help or. Uh, lifting assistance in four, meaning I need help with lifting in room four. And the, the most common thing is sliding back and forth from the gurneys to the bed and back for ED patients or floor patients. But every now and then you get somebody in a wheelchair that, that you, you need somebody to kind of hold the wheelchair steady. Even though you can lock it, you need somebody to kind of hold it steady while another person helps them stand up and pivot and sit back down. And... Um, so there's usually somebody around that can help you with, with the heavy stuff. Never feel obligated to move a heavy patient all by yourself. That's for sure. If you don't think you can, it's it's never expected that you're going to kill yourself to move a patient around. So, all right. I'm going to put you on mute and uh, do a little bit of computer work here. If you need something, just post a question. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by.
here's another thing I don't know if you've seen. There's a lot of reports coming out about these uh, face mask patients are wearing or burning patients' faces in the MRIs. So if you're at a facility and you see them putting uh, face masks in the MRI scanner, make sure and let them know. Uh, here's an article at Ant Mini. Patient report to FDA uh, describes MRI face mask burn. A patient report submitted October to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration describes a third-degree burn a patient sustained while wearing a face mask during an MRI exam. The report was submitted to the FDA's Manufacturing User Facility Device Experience Database, or MOD, and it identifies the event as having occurred on September 27th. The agency received it on October 6th. The report does not name the device used or the healthcare provider. Uh, it's, the statement shows full thickness burns to the face. Hey, Taligos. 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 Full thickness burns to the face. I went in for a three Tesla MRI scan on the cervical spine. The tech failed to let me street clothes and also allowed me to wear my face mask, which resulted in deep tissue burns across my nose, eyes, mouth, jaw, chin, and neck. Basically, I have a mask burned into my face. This is a patient who wore a mask in MRI. Uh, back on December 7th, just a few weeks ago, the FDA issued a warning to remind healthcare providers to prevent patients from wearing masks with any metal components during an MRI exam but it's unclear whether this particular report was the reason for the guidance. So again, if you guys see anybody going in MRI with the mask on, tell them to check out Ant Mini. There's a report on there uh, titled Patients Report to FDA Describes MRI Face Burn, Face Mask Burn. Um, yeah, I've worked uh, a couple places. Um, I started out... Uh, you asked me if I worked outside of my home state. So I I started in Arizona, I guess we'll call my home state. I grew up in Oklahoma. I was there until I was 21, and then I moved to Arizona to go to Arizona State. And I lived there for 21 years, and then I moved up here to Idaho. So in Arizona, um, that's where I went to x-ray school and phlebotomy school and all that stuff. So I worked probably 15 years in healthcare down in Arizona between – Oh, back then they were Desert Samaritans and uh, Chandler Regionals, ISIS Healthcare had three hospitals. Uh, everything's been bought out and resold five times since then. So now it's now it's Banner and Dignity and I don't know what they're all called. But yeah, I've worked in Arizona. I've worked in uh, Idaho. I did work in Oklahoma a little bit. I, I went back there one summer and did ultrasound in a little town called Kingfisher. And before I, I before I moved up to Flagstaff, Arizona. So um, you just have to check and see, you know, if you're asking because you're wondering about state licensure and stuff, um, you just have to check and see what's needed where you're at. But usually they give you a grace period too. If you, if you move somewhere and take a job, they don't necessarily expect that state license right away. Usually there's some kind of a time frame given. So thanks for asking though. Just rolling through uh, Ant Mini. CMS finalizes major cut in radiology reimbursement. We saw that coming, right? Because it happens all the time. December 8th, U.S. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has released the final set of rules that will govern the Medicare payment system for the coming year thereby affirming the drastic cut in radiology reimbursement for 2021 that was proposed earlier this year. Let's see. Um, the conversion factor was originally proposed to be cut 10.6% for 2021, but the final figure brought it down to 10.2%. Oh, that's not much cheaper, but they try to act like it is. Uh, what does it say? So diagnostic radiology, we'll get a 10% cut, IR 8%, nuclear medicine 8%, and radiation oncology and therapy 5%. 
uh, restructuring and evaluation of management services. Let's see. Blah, 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 billing and coding speak. Blah, blah, blah. Impact on high volume radiology procedures. We conducted an in-depth analysis of the practical effects of the fee schedule restructuring at the time the proposed rule was announced in August 2020. At that time, we concluded that the decrease in professional component for a typical radiology practice would be approximately, as CMS estimated, around 11 to 12 percent. With the revised conversion factor, the estimate using the data shows most procedures will be cut. Yeah, so 11 percent. So they're taking our money away, which means we got to work smarter and harder and more efficient. Miss Maxial, I know I said that all kinds of wrong. New here. How long did you work? Are you still working? How many injuries and how many surgeries? Oh, well, that's a mouthful. Um, how long did you work? So I, you're talking radiology. I went into the x-ray program in 2003. So that's 17 years in radiology. Before that, I actually went through a phlebotomy program at Pima Medical Institute, same place I took my x-ray program at. And I did phlebotomy for probably close to 10 years. So I, I really liked it, liked working in the hospital, and it felt kind of invasive, but um, nobody was ever happy to see you. <laughs> they were like, I hope you're good, I'll let you do. And of course, I wanted to say, well, if I suck, I'm not going to tell you. So after a while of the negativity, I, I looked for something else, and that's when I came across um, x-ray. Uh, so, and am I still working? So I moved into management uh, about... 10 years ago ish. Um, I went through x ray school, learned CT, got those certifications, then went back for ultrasound school, then learned MRI. And then at one point, finally, somebody offered me a management position and I took it. And that was in Flagstaff. And then that which reminds me, I need to call her. Um, gave a talk yesterday uh, for MTMI. And that triggered the. Uh, one of the administrators up at Flag to ask me for my number, but I haven't heard from him yet. Um, so I've been in it. I went from manager of clinical. It was called clinical manager. It's interesting when you get into management, all the different titles and duties and all that stuff. And maybe that's what we're talking about sometime if anybody's interested. But I started, you know, when you're, te you're a tech, you can go through like different levels of tech, tech one, two, and three. And then you can be a lead tech. And then usually it's lead tech goes to supervisor, to manager, to director. And then sometimes there's a system director who's over all the radiology departments throughout the whole system. So I, I did all those except uh, supervisor. I never got the supervisor. I went from uh, kind of a lead tech to a manager in Flagstaff. And that meant I was kind of over the staff there, but there was a director that ran another hospital about two hours away. And then I reported to them. And then after that, I moved up here and got the director spot and ran this hospital and another hospital and a lot of outpatient clinics. I did that for four years. And then I got promoted to a system level and was over all the hospitals in the state for that company. And then they had a, a what do they call it, a reorganization uh, where they trimmed a whole line of administrators. First, they had all the CEOs. Every CEO, about nine CEOs, got axed with no warning. Um and then they started systematically going after others. And that's the interesting part that you guys may or may not know. And, and I, I, maybe it'll help you to know so you don't worry so much. Um, it's, it's very rare that during a company restructure or a company reorganization or downsizing or whatever, um, they always go after administration first. And if you like, if you go on LinkedIn and you look up a particular, uh, even CEOs of hospitals or vice presidents or CNOs, CFOs, COOs, radiology directors, you rarely see anybody at the same job for more than a couple of years. And um, one of the reasons for that is because if you've noticed as a tech, if you're in x-ray and you learn how to do CT and you, you get that little pay increase, that pay increase does not equal what you would get if you jump ship and you go somewhere else and get hired on as a CT tech. And the same thing for if you go from CT to MRI, you may get a few dollars an hour for doing that. But if you go somewhere else and get hired as an MRI tech, you're going to get even more. And so you see that grass is greener phenomenon a lot. 
And that's one of the downsides I, I put in my article about why you should cross train. That's one of the negatives is it, is it once a person is cross trained, if they're not loyal to the company, uh, they'll bolt and go somewhere else to make more money. And I actually had that happen once from a guy I didn't expect it to happen to you. He left because it was a little bit more money. And um, I think they offered a cross training in CT. He went from, he went from X-ray to MR, I believe. And uh, this other place that we'll pay you more and cross training for CT. And what they're really saying is we'll pay you more, but we're going to make you do more work. And it was a lot farther away from his hometown. So actually ended up, he came back and I hired him back and he's a great guy. Uh, no hard feelings. I, I knew it was going to happen. I knew he was going to get out there and go, well, this wasn't worth it at all. But sometimes you gotta, you gotta learn and grow. And um, you know, had he left on bad feelings, I'd have said, you're not coming back, but not non-issue. I don't blame somebody for trying to leave for more money. Um, and he did leave me high and dry. You know, we knew when he was leaving. So that's the thing about cross training is, is you gotta be um, mindful about, is it worth, how do I even get off on that? We're talking about what I do. Um, so, so, sorry. Oh, we we're talking about my job. So we, we were talking about, they don't go after frontliners, they go after administrators. So the time came when they came after me and they let me go. And then uh, I kind of sat back that it's always, for me, it's always in the holidays. Twice it's happened to me at Christmas. Um, so it happened to me at last Christmas. And then uh, I kind of sat back for a few months trying to figure out, I, I tried to kind of slide into early retirement. And my wife's like, I don't think so, mister. So I took a contract at another town for three months to, um, they'd been without a director for, I don't know, probably a year. And um, things were just kind of a mess. There wasn't any real leadership there. So I went in and uh, reevaluated everything. They, they needed kind of the whole, the whole department was laid out strange. And um, I proposed to move some rooms around and then they needed to up, they had a 16 slice CT scanner. I said, you got to upgrade that um, in the MRI suite. Uh, you know, those big silver square buttons on the hospital walls you hit to open the door. So the, the zone four door, the one that takes you right into the magnet, had one of those buttons next to the door that you hit and the door would open. And right next to that zone, that zone four door open button was the emergency off button right next to the big square button. So if you did it wrong, you would hit the emergency off button on the, on the magnet and just all kinds of stuff like the, the zone three door, because this hot, this town was on kind of a slope, this hospital had started to kind of lean after a while. And so the door to zone three wouldn't even shut because the door jam was crooked. So you got door three that won't shut. And then you got door four with an automatic opener next to a, a power down button. Uh, it's, so it's just a mess. So I went up there and I made a bunch of um, recommendations and kind of cleaned a bunch of stuff up and started trying to help out. But then COVID hit and they came in and ended up again, all administration, my, I hit my 90 days. They're like, you're gone. They got rid of the head of HR. They got rid of the head of nursing. They got rid of this couple that had started a sleep center for them. And so I'm like, okay, COVID crazy. And I'm right in the middle of my doctorate, right? I'm, I'm right in the middle of my EDD. And so I said to my wife, why don't we chill for a bit? You know, you, you keep doing your x-ray tech thing. I'll see what I can do on the side or whatever. And, and we'll, we'll get it through until I get out of school. So I am sitting out right now watching all this craziness go on. Of course, I still talk to all my director buddies around the country and, and text locally are still talking to me about what's going on locally. And um, my, my local manager that I brought out from California uh, about three years ago, uh, he just got promoted to a system down in Utah He's going to be a director down there. So he's moving up. We got him all nice and uh, trained him up as a manager and taught him a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and now he's going to take a stab down in Utah and Ogden um, at being a, a director down there. So um, that's where I'm at. How, how many injuries have I had? None. I haven't had any. I, I uh, pulled uh, a hamstring a long time ago, pulling a patient up on my CT scanner. 
uh, but it was it was better by the next day. So um, no surgeries, no no injuries really that that I can remember. Um, I, I may have caused a few. I, I'll never forget. We we're just talking the other day. The the uh, the old man that trained me when I was an X-ray student, old Captain Shepard. He was an Army uh, Vietnam veteran, and uh, we were doing a portable in the ICU or something. And I don't know if you guys have ever done it, but you, you know, somebody's on one side of the gurney and you're on the other and they, they kind of swing the boom arm around to you and you catch it and you angle it and you put the plate behind them and you shoot it. And then you swing the boom arm back to the other person and they stick it down in the little holder and off you go. Well, I, I, I swung it around a little too hard and he didn't see it swinging around and it clocked him right in the head. And uh, he wasn't too happy about that. And that's when I learned quit swinging the boom arm around. But um, no, I, I don't have any, I don't have any injuries and I haven't had any surgery. So if you pay attention to what you're doing and the biggest thing is ask for help when you need the help. Can you do it by yourself? Probably. Will it, will it injure you? Probably not, but uh, it's not worth um, throwing your back out Uh just to get one patient off of a table, always ask for a lifting assistance, boosting help, whatever. There's always somebody around somewhere uh, that can help you with that. So to Legos, I'm planning to go to work abroad. Any advices on how, of how to make a good impression and try to fit to the new hospital environment. Yeah, that's always tough, man. No matter what, what part of life you're in, trying to fit in is rough. Um, you want to be u- uber stealthy about it. Go find them all on Facebook and see what they're doing and, and check them out, see what they like and kind of treat treat Facebook as like a dossier, right? You ever seen the James Bond where he's given a dossier folder that contains everything about the person he's checking out or spying on? Um, Facebook's that's what I, if I go out for a new job, if I go to if I'm going to go apply somewhere, I always go look up the CEO. Um, HR people, whoever's going to be interviewing me, I always go look that stuff up. It's either on Facebook or LinkedIn. So you can always go. T- techs aren't so big on LinkedIn, although some of them are there because LinkedIn's really a place for the for the administrators to network. But if you're a tech that ever wants to get into administration, go put yourself a profile on LinkedIn. I have an article on my blog that tells you how to do that and what looks good. But as far as fitting in, my advice is always kind of that old standby advice of it's better better to be silent and be thought of fool than speak and let it be known. So if you don't have anything to say, don't say anything at all. Play the shy, quiet type. It'll it'll pique their interest. You know, how come they don't talk? What, what are they thinking? That kind of a thing. Whereas if you're one of those people that just blabbers on and on, then they're going to know everything about you in, in the first day or two. So just ease in there and do your job, work hard in your job and working hard. And um, don't say a lot of, uh, well, where I used to work, this is how we used to do it. Nobody wants to hear that. Um, they do things the way they want to do. Now, that, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, stuck in their ways and they're not open to change or they don't want to know how they can do things better. Just watch how you say it and who you say it to. Because nobody, nobody likes a person that comes in and says, oh, you, you use that technique? Oh, well, I've always used this technique. Well, good for you. You know, use what you want to use. So just, just slide in there, do your job. And um, some hospitals, some, some imaging groups hang out together and party together and have barbecues together, and, and some don't at all. The, the local hospital here had the RAD group, uh, radiologists, uh, it was a group of seven of them, and those guys hardly ever talked outside of work at all. Um, a couple of them maybe every now and then, but um, I've never seen anything like that where they never got together. I would have the annual Christmas parties, and it was like getting blood from a stone to get three of the seven rats to show up to the company Christmas party. So um, that's my advice, brother. Just slide in there, do your thing, keep your head down. Uh, if you mess something up, just be real quick to apologize, maybe even take notes, write stuff down, you know, um, it depends on, you know, you might carry a little notebook or like I have a, uh, I have it here. I carry, I get it from Costco, but it's about yay big. 
Um, and it's just an empty notebook that I, I keep notes on every day. And then you can go back at the end of every week and reflect on what you've written down. Um, because, you know, if, if you think, oh, that makes sense. I don't need to write that down. Three days later, you won't remember it. So just take notes and listen and, and be um, observant. And uh, I think you'll be fine. Um, Darnell's back. Darnell says, do you see more wrist and shoulder injuries working in ultra? Yeah, I was just talking about that right before you popped on. Um, and I was trying to illustrate it on screen. You, you, um, you have to reach across the pit. This is my probe, right? You have to reach across, watch me in the video somehow. You have to reach across the patient. Uh, when you're sitting in your chair and you've got your monitor in front of you and you got your probe, you got to hit that left kidney and the spleen. And you, you know, just like x-ray where you got to do things in two planes, you got to do the same thing in ultrasound. So you got to figure out how to probe into two planes and, you know, you're, you're sweeping up and down and you're sweeping side to side and you're, you're kind of rotating a little bit uh, and you might need to push harder to get, get further into the body or, or let loose. And so what that does with that, that pinching, that constant pinching and pushing and man, that really, uh, I can feel it right there. <laughs> that really gets to the wrist and um, some of them have shoulder issues and uh, my buddy Jim, Jim Owen, who taught me how to do ultrasound many years ago, um, he's had shoulder issues for a long time. Uh, I think he's even had issues in, in the elbow and, and wrist too, but um, there's just no getting around that because you have to be, you have to extend out, right? I mean, you could, you could try turning the patient around so that you're right there, but then you're still, you know, pushing like this outward. There, there's just no easy way to do it. Um, which is one of the reasons I like CAT scan, right? Uh, CAT scan, you just lay your patient on the table and scan them. Uh, and it collects all the detail for you. Ultrasound, you really got to go hunting it down. And, oh, can you put your, I can't quite get to your, can you move your neck just a little more? And it's kind of, you know, it's hard. Uh, ultrasound can be, can be a hard gig. So um, you do see wrist and shoulder injuries in ultrasound. X-ray, it's usually back because you're, you're lifting patients and pulling patients and pushing patients. Um, I would say it's a lot more lower back, mid to lower back in x-ray. Um, zesty, in terms of grasping being a tech, where should a first year student be? I found the classroom stuff kind of easy, but the clinical is challenging. Yeah, so that depends on the type of learner you are. Um, if you're a visual, visual cue learner, sitting in class watching a lecture, you'll just get it. I knew some guys that could just could just watch and listen and totally understood it and could take the test where I would have to write it down and study it and like memorize things. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I'm visual and audio as well. In fact, I like as many cues as I can get. I'm a see one, do one, teach one person. So um, you may pick up classroom easy because of that. Or if you have a photographic memory, that helps too. Um, clinical. Clinical is different because you don't have one medium showing you what's going on. In a classroom, you've got one teacher, right, putting stuff up on the board or, or however they're teaching you. But in clinicals, you got a 3D environment that's saying, come over here and do this and put the patient over there and run up to the floor and get that patient for me. And here, go run this cassette for me. And, hey, can you go wipe down that room while I go get this next patient? And there's a lot of interactive running around uh, in the real world or in the clinical sites that um, can make it a little more challenging. Plus, don't forget, I mean, I don't know how it is where you're set up, but a student could touch 10 techs in one shift, depending on how, how big of a department it is. I've seen places where the, the clinical instructor there on site will say, you know, today, Bob, you're going to be paired up with Tom and you're just going to hang out in the ER all day. And you just get one tech, one student together all day long. But I've seen other ones where they go, hey, it's uh, kind of crazy today. Uh, a lot of people come in just for short shifts. So why don't you just watch what comes off the printer? If you can do it, grab somebody to go with you. If you don't think you can do it, you know, figure out who's going to do it and go with them. Uh, and then, you know, around 2 o'clock, can you go up and, and stand with so-and-so because there's a certain procedure up there that I'd really like you to see. And so you're going to get a lot of different things going on at the clinical site that's not quite you know, near as sedentary as the classroom. So uh, that's kind of what you're asking. The other one is, is where should a first year student be? 
So, I mean, it depends on the structure of where the positioning and anatomy class is. But by the end of the first year, I'm thinking you should have the basic uh, chest and, and probably extremities down. You know, you should probably be able to do a hand, wrist, forearm, elbow. I, I think depending on how you're structured, you know, typically programs will teach the basics and then put you in fluoro and do the BEs and the small small bowel follow-throughs, the upper GIs, the softograms, lumbar punctures, all that kind of stuff. But that depends on the site where you're at because if it's a hit or, if it's a hit or miss or maybe they only get one lumbar puncture a week or whatever, they may say, hey, I know you need to comp that wrist, but come over here and watch this lumbar puncture because we don't get very many of them. So it's hard to say where you should be, but if you're feeling inadequate, that's normal. That's completely normal. It'll take you all the way to the end and then somewhere around the end because you, you won't you won't have accomplished that goal till you pass the boards, right? So you're going to have this doubt all the way to you pass your boards. So just keep on your test, pass the test, pass the competencies. Um, I think I, I felt better when I was ahead of the curve on competencies. So I had a, I had a guy in my class named Jojo. Jojo and I would have a comp, um, not war, but a contest who could get the most competencies. And so every day we were, we were like actively going after comps. Um, and it, and it feels really good if by the end of the semester, you're supposed to have 25 comps and you got 50. So that, that could be another way that you look at it. Are you ahead of the game on your competencies? Um, because really when it comes down to it as a student and clinical rotations, that's really what it's all about. It's not learning the medical record software that the clinical site uses. It's not learning, uh, you know, who does what at the hospital. It's how to do each protocol for each exam uh, in, a, in a way that gives you a good diagnostically relevant image. So if that didn't answer your question, ask it another way. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, I think I saw you on here the other day. Um, found the list of clinical sites. Sweet. Also have an appointment with guidance counselor. Any good questions to ask them in preparation for applying this March? Yeah, that's, that's a big topic. Um, so we talked about clinicals because for those of you that don't know, um, you, you and that's part of why I do this Q&A thing is because you're just going to end up in this, in this interview or in this school and not know what's coming next. So Clinical rotations, you know what those are, but did you know that maybe you can pick which one you should go on? Um, when I was in school, and I, th I said this to Sarah the other day, I think when she was on, when I was in school, they wrote all the clinical sites up on the board, and they put all our names in a hat, and they drew your name. And when, when your name was drawn, you went up and wrote your name by which clinical site you wanted. So if you researched it ahead of time, you could find out who has weekend clinicals, who lets their students stay late if you have a job and you need to work around that, or who does level one traumas, or who does more surgeries or whatever it is you're interested in. I was interested in weekend clinicals because I had a job during the week. So I found a little poet on hospital that did Friday, Saturday, Sunday clinicals. And when my name was picked, nobody else had grabbed it. So I got that one and it worked out perfectly. Everybody typically who's thinking about it is going after the level one trauma centers because they're, you know, we all like that stuff. We like that adrenaline. We used to watch ER uh, Dr. Green and all that stuff, but, um, and they're exciting and that's where you get the most experience. Don't get me wrong. You should hit a level one, you should hit a level one trauma and you should hit a, uh, an outpatient clinic. Those are the two main ones. And then if you want to hit a critical access hospital, you can, that's where you get more opportunity to cross train as a student. And that's what I found. I went to a little 20 bed hospital where it was just two of two techs on with me on the weekend and the lead tech out of the two techs was also the CT tech. And so he trained me CT while I was an x-ray student. So when I graduated x-ray school, I was hired as a CT tech right out of x-ray school. So knowing your clinicals ahead of time and smartly choosing where you go can benefit you greatly. It also matters if you want to work there. If you, if you know for a, without a doubt that there's one particular hospital that you want to work at, you better get your clinicals there. Because if you if you clinical there for two years, that means they trained you how to be a, a, how to work exactly on their equipment for two years, and they didn't have to pay a dime because you have to pay for training. They'd be nuts not to hire you at the end of that two year mark as long as you did a good job. So if you know you want to work at that facility, you want to try to get your clinical rotations there, or vice versa. If you know you don't want to be anywhere near that facility, 
Like we had a place in Phoenix called Maryvale that was kind of scary. In fact, we called it Scary Vale. Uh, and nobody wanted to work there because of the things we'd heard that had gone on there. So it, it behooves you to use my Scrabble word of the day to check out your clinical sites um, like Sarah did. You can actually ask for them before you even interview to get into the school. And that will impress them because you're starting to look down the line and they say, well, why, why do you need the list of clinical sites to interview for the school? Well, because I'm trying to plan out my, my daycare, my travel time. Uh, you know, don't talk about working while you're in school because they don't want to hear that. They think, no, no. The, the reason they don't want you to work in school is because they want you to do as good as you can possibly do because the schools get graded on how well you do. So don't talk about work, but just let them, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out my schedule and I have a family. I have this, I have that, other obligations. And it would help me to know how far away the clinical site is and what the hours of the clinical rotations are. Because you can have day rotation, second shift rotation. I think they stopped overnights, but you never know. So, um, so Sarah's asking about questions to, uh, to prepare for applying. So, okay. So when you go to your interview, you want to know, um, what's their graduation rate? How many, you know, when people finish the program, how many say they let 10 kids in the program? I'm sorry, I don't mean kids, 10 people into the program. How many graduate nine or five? And, um, you know, maybe they'll be truthful about that. Maybe they won't. And maybe you need to ask for the last five years because what I've seen is, is they'll, uh, people start dropping out of a program because of a teacher or something like that. And the school will fire that person, get a better teacher. And then you get more people graduating. So if you say, how many did you graduate last year? They may say, well, out of 10, 10 graduated. Hmm, how about the last five years? What's your percentage rate? Um, so how many did they graduate? How many got jobs right out of school? because they, schools should be helping graduates find jobs. Um, they, they, they will want to see you successful. They don't want to just graduate you and never see you again, because if you can't find a job and you start telling people that, then you might affect and drive down enrollment rates at that school. So ask them if they, uh, how many of their graduating class, what's the percentage that finds a job within one month of graduation? Um, how many pass the ARRT boards? What's the passing rate? 100% of the class, 90% of the class. That'll give you an idea of how well they prepare you for the boards. Um, of course, ask for the total cost. Um, ask if there's any scholarships available through the school. Um, what else with the school? You'll have to think about that some more. I, I have a couple of articles on the blog. If you go to the, the radiologictechnologist.com, um, I believe there's a couple articles about interviewing and tips. Yeah, there's a tips and tricks to get in. Uh, and then there's one that I think I listed 11 different ways to pay for x-ray school, all the different ways to pay. Sorry, my, my, I'm still working on the Santa Claus beard, and it's a little out of control at this point. I've, I've, I've bleached it twice. And I've got to bleach it a little bit more because I'm still a little brown. Uh, they, they say I look like a smoker Santa because I got the, the brown right here. But a uh, couple more bleaches and uh, I'll be ready to go uh, see the kids. But um, I hope that answered your question, sir. If not, shoot me an email and we'll go over it some more. Um, somebody just sent morning. They emailed me their um, essay that they have to turn in uh, for uh, application to the program. And they asked me to review it. And I don't have any problems doing that. You guys can send me, uh, send me your resume. Uh, I've got an article on what your resume should look like, but you can send me a resume and I'll go over it. Send me your essay and I'll go over it. If you need ideas, uh, whatever, just, just email it to me. I don't have any problem going over that stuff. Um, I've got uh, a YouTube video on this channel where I review, I think six or seven applications, but those are tech applications applying for a tech job, but it's still, some of it's kind of the basics. It's like, um, you know, ones that are too busy, ones that are horrible with spelling, uh, some that talk about jobs that don't have anything to do with what you're applying for, uh, different things like that. But you can always take a look at that and look at those because you, you should be turning in uh, a resume with your application. At least some schools do. Um, there's nine of you on. There's like two thumbs up, guys. Hit some thumbs up up there. I think YouTube likes that. Uh, what else we got? Darnell's pushing me for a giveaway. What do you want me to give away, bro? Are you after the books? Is that what you're after? Um, 
last time I gave away one of those posable skeletons so everybody could practice their positioning on it. Maybe I'll do markers. I've been seeing a lot of people. I had to order some markers for my wife. Uh, we, her and I love those markers that have the little round circle at the bottom with the three beads so that if, if you're supine, you know, it shows it with the beads. And if they're upright, it shows them at the bottom. Uh, it saves you all that time from having to, to put an arrow or right upright or whatever. Um, but maybe I'll do some markers. I don't know. You tell me, Darnell, what do you want me to give away? And what do you have to do to win? How about that? That'll save me some time if you figure that out. Let's see. Akira, overall, in all states, is it difficult to enter in the radiology tech program? In my college, the career is really competitive, and there is a limit access. They choose about 25 students. You know, um, so one of the things I did during COVID was I started offering a $25 uh, payment to anyone who graduated a program and wanted to write me a little essay on what they thought of the program. And I actually um, included certain criteria. It couldn't just be a willy nilly, but it, you know, it's what did you think of the, the classes? What did you think of your clinicals? What you, did you have equipment at your, at your uh, school to practice on? Um, all these different tests or questions. And so um, I would, I, I turn those into posts and I publish them so that anybody looking for that particular school, if I've got a review by someone who's graduated, that's even better. So um, been doing that, I got to know some of the programs around the country. And uh, there are some schools, I swear, they must just let anybody and everybody in there because I get people emailing me, asking me questions. And I'm thinking, why aren't you past that by now in your class? Um, I had a girl once tell me that the interview just consisted of like, do you want in the program? Or they didn't even have an interview or I don't even know. It's like, how did you, how do they weed out the people that shouldn't be there? Because we don't want people in there that don't deserve to be in there. It just makes it harder on everybody else. Have you ever had a job somewhere where somebody you worked with totally sucked and you had to cover half of their stuff because they didn't know what they're doing? That's what happens when x-ray schools let anybody and everybody in. So there, there are some like that. Um, so is it hard across the country? No. I want to say this one place is in Illinois somewhere, but you look at how much they pay because there's um, I got some articles on what every state pays and you can tell the they're paying like 15 bucks an hour for an x-ray tech in that area where they're pumping anybody and everybody through that school. So you can tell how it, how it affects the profession overall when, when they're not picky. Normally you get something that, you know, it's, uh, I would say an average class is 10 to 15 and you can get anywhere up to a hundred applicants or as low as 30. That's probably pretty standard across the country. Um, some schools, it took my wife three tries to get in uh, because there were so many applicants and so many Where we went, uh, Pima Medical Institute in Mesa, you had to interview, you had to write a little essay, you had to take a little uh, test called the Wonderlook test, which is kind of like a basic skills test. Um, and then it was all a point-based system. So you got you know, a certain amount of points for how well you did on your interview, points for how well you did on the Wonderlick, points for your essay. You got points, you got like a point if you were over 50 years old or something. You got a point, one point if you had applied before and not gotten in. Thanks for the thumbs up, guys. <laughs> Jump from like two to six. Um, but you got points for being a vet. So um, those, those might be questions back to Sarah th that you ask in an interview is, you know, how do you choose who gets into this program? Is it based on this interview that I'm doing alone? Or is it based on other things that I have to do? And they'll usually tell you all that before the interview. Like I always recommend volunteering. If nothing else, go volunteer at a hospital, even if you never even see the radiology department. Just go volunteer in the gift shop and wherever you can get in, parking cars, whatever. So at least you can say you were there and then while you're there, there's always some way that you can talk to somebody about the radiology department. Even if it's just talking to the greeter, hey, yeah, I'd love to see the radiology department, but I understand you got COVID and all that, and I can't go back. Have you seen anybody, do you know anybody back that I could talk to at my lunch break? Or, you know, you just got to ask some basic questions. And as soon as you can talk to one person from radiology, that's enough that when you're in your interview, you can say, I volunteered at the hospital and I talked to somebody in radiology and I got a better understanding of how it works. And the school administrators, the interviewers always like that more than somebody who's never taken a look at it. Because there are people that want to go into our field that don't have a clue what we do. 
And that's the first thing you got to weed out. If you don't have a clue what it is, the odds are you're, you're not going to want in it once you do find out what it is. Um, so um, that was for Akira. No, it's not super hard all across the country, but there are some places that it's ridiculously hard. So it depends on where you're at. And, and I asked once the local college, we got one school in all of Southern Idaho that teaches x-ray and they do like 10 students or something and, or 12. And I went, I went to them one time and I said, look, can you, can you increase the class size to at least 15? Because I'm not even getting enough. See, the thing is a class may take 15, but half of those uh, graduates already know where they're already going somewhere else. They've already uh, got idea. They may even be going back out of state where they're from. They may have only come here to go to the school and get back out because they got in quicker or something. But then out of, out of the seven or whatever that's left, uh, you may not want all of them because if they rotated through your hospital, you get to know them personally. You may know that one's lazy. That one, uh, you know, is a know-it-all. Uh, that one got into it with a doctor or whatever. So it kind of boils down out of a class of 12. There may be two or three that you like total. And the side, the, at a 200-bed hospital, you're going to need more than two or three techs a year because of attrition and people moving up and people retiring and people moving away and people passing on and that kind of stuff. So, um, oh, so when I asked him if they'd increase it, he said he couldn't because the state who helps fund the college has a requirement that you get, that you have to prove for every person you graduate, you have to prove that they can get a job. And if you can't prove that, so if he graduates 15, he's got to prove all 15 can get a job. Well, they probably can't. That's probably too many, but we know that half of them go out of state. So I'm kind of stuck there because the state may think that I've got plenty to choose from, but I don't. And if I ever could prove that I could hire more than 15, by the time I do the paperwork and he does the paperwork and he submits it all, it's like a year or two down the road before he can get his class size increased. So um, so there's a reason they hold him at a certain level. Uh, but like I saw back in 2008, 2010, metropolitan area, we had like nine x-ray schools pop up overnight down there and it just decimated. Um, nobody could find a job. I, I'm exaggerating. I had three jobs. I didn't have a problem finding a job, but some people had a hard time finding a job. So, um, so you want to keep the schools, you know, one or two in the area, but um, you definitely can sense when there's not enough students right now, there's not enough students across the country. Um, I was just looking the other day, you know, there's a strike in Chicago that the x-ray techs are involved in. Um, and when you talk about, you know, you always hear about the nurses and how important they are. There's 3.8 million nurses in the United States. If the nurses go on strike, you just hire other ones, travelers, temporaries. If x-ray department going on strike, there's only 337,000 licensed techs in the country and that's licensed may and may not even be working anymore. So you're going to have, you know, 300,000 versus 3 million. You're going to have a lot harder time finding backup for an x-ray strike, which is why you never hear of them. But um, I'm really curious to see what happens in Chicago. I don't know if you guys saw that, but they were posting in our Facebook groups. If you were willing to cross the picket line and go work in Chicago for two weeks, they're paying 5,000 a week, plus room and board, hotel food, all that stuff. If you would just show up out there on a Saturday and get all your all your paperwork and everything signed, hit the ground running by either it's either Sunday or Monday morning, a two week guaranteed contract, possible third week if negotiations were finalized, and it was five grand a week because you can't find X-ray techs like you can nurses. But I digress. Um, Sarah, tomorrow is my last final. Go on the college site and try to set up a meeting in order to supplement for shadowing that I cannot do to COVID. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's a great idea. That's brilliant. If you, if they won't let you walk through the department because of COVID, if you can meet with them in the cafeteria, if the cafeteria is even open, um, just sit with them in the cafeteria and, and say, tell me about your department. Tell me about how many x-rays do you do a year? How many, um, how many texts do you have in your department? Uh, what are some of the different shifts? Do you guys all run on set on 12 hour shifts or do you have tens or eights or um, how many texts are on at night? Uh, how much fluoro do you do? How many IR cases do you do? Um, do you do a lot of call? Uh, do people, or do people get called in a lot? Um, 
you could you can ask the exact same questions over a lunch than you can walking through a sea in person. So that's fine too. Congratulations on getting to your last uh, test. I've turned in mine Friday, and I'm I feel. Uh, I, I got two more semesters and I'm done forever. So uh, that's awesome. Um, how big is the actual radiology community? How well are you connected? Well, it's 337,000 people that's licensed. Um, uh, I'm connected somewhat because uh, I've been in it for almost 20 years. I've been going to uh, the RSNA for about the past 10 years. The RSNA, if, if you're not aware of that, uh, Radiology Society of North America is an annual party. <laughs> I'll, call it, I'll call it a party. But it's the annual um, convention in Chicago. It's always in Chicago. They've been having it for 100 years, probably like 75. But they've been having it for a long, long time. And it's the Disneyland of radiology. And by that, I mean it's a huge Chicago convention center that's probably six floors and they fill the entire thing with radiology equipment. They actually bring MRI scanners and CAT scan machines, uh, full-on equipment, and they're showing you the latest and greatest of what's coming out on the market, and every vendor is there. Every single vendor is there, and it's a week long, and on top of all these vendor presentations, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of seminars you can sit in on that are a half hour to an hour, so if you really want to learn, I don't know, the Epic uh, EMR uh, software, there's probably a couple seminars on, on the Epic platform and you can go take those. And um, it's just, it's a blast. It, it's in freezing cold Chicago and it's always during, I think it's the first week of December or no, first week of November. It's always during a rad tech week, it seems like. Second week, November. Um, but I've been going to the RSNA for a long time, and uh, I've been a member of the AHRA for five or six years, which is the Association for Radiology Management. I've spoken at their annual conference for the last four years, um, and then and my, my last big role uh, at the system level, I was the delegate for the entire hospital system to deal with uh, purchase negotiation contracts. And so these big hospital systems have a company that acts like their Costco or their Sam's Club, and it's called a group purchasing organization or GPO. And every hospital has one person for radiology that's their delegate to go to these GPO um, meetings. It's four times a year, and it's at the headquarters of this one particular GPO called Health Trust. And their headquarters was in Nashville, Tennessee, so four times a year, I flew to Nashville and sat in a room for anywhere from two days to a week and watched vendors come through and give us presentations. And we would grade them after they left the room and we would decide, do we put them on contract or do we not? Do we give them a sole contract or a dual contract with another company? And so that all this stuff culminates into meeting a lot of people in the business, whether they're radiology administrators or they're vendors or presidents of these companies. So, um, yeah, I know I know quite a few uh, I just posted a picture the other day of me having lunch with the head of Canon uh, in Chicago a few years ago. Um, so I don't know if you're asking for a particular reason, uh, but if you need help getting in somewhere, let me know. Let's see. Is it easy to find a job after you graduate? It depends on the population of your city, Akira. If you're in um, Dallas or Los Angeles or Chicago or New York City, um, or Phoenix, maybe, uh, the more people look at the housing market. Is it hard to find a, an apartment to rent where you're at? Is it hard to find a house uh, to buy or rent? <clears throat> Same thing's going to happen to the jobs in a large city where you have too many people, you're going to have a hard time finding a job, but there's, there's a methodology to that. And that's that you, you do good at your clinicals to your clinicals where you want the job. And as soon as you graduate, you get a PRN job if that's all they'll give you, because that gets your foot in the door. Most places like that will only hire from within. So if a golden day shift opens, they'll let people internally apply first. So night shift may want to go to day shift and finally get off of the night shift. 
or whatever, but that they'll pick the PRN people that are on staff already to fill open positions before they'll hire from outside. So the people that graduate x-ray school that, that graduate and try to find a full-time job and can't get it and get all upset that they can't find a job, that's because of the market that you're in where you live. And you've got to realize that, that you should pick up a PRN job at maybe even more than one location. I've had PRN jobs at three hospitals at one time. And if you don't understand how that works, when you're a PRN tech, that means you're available for work, but it doesn't mean you have to work. A PRN, which is Latin for as needed, I forget what the letters stand for, but a PRN tech, they will call you and say, I had a call out this morning. Can you come in and work from 10 to 10? As a PRN tech, you are not obligated to say yes. If you are a part-time employee, you are obligated or potentially obligated. If you are even a point one, so they do these full-time employees by a point status. If you're a 1.0 employee, you're a full-time employee. If you're a 0.9 employee, you're guaranteed 36 hours a week, but they can work you up to 40. If you're a 0.8, you're guaranteed 32 hours a week, but they can work you up to 40. So a little sneaky thing they like doing now is they don't give you full-time positions anymore. They give you a 0.8 because a 32-hour a week is still considered full-time, and you get your benefits, but they don't have to work you 40 hours a week if there's no business because of COVID. So you can work 32 hours a week, still be considered full-time by the company, still qualify for benefits, but they don't have to work you full-time. They don't have to pay you a full 40 hours a week. So that's kind of another thing that this trend where they're starting to hire people to 0.8 status and sending you home at that 32 hour mark uh, and not guaranteeing you any hours above that because they don't have to. So if you're a PRN and you're PRNing at three different hospitals and two call you with open shifts, which one do you want more? And take that one. And decline the other one, but do it politely and professionally. Sorry, I can't take that shift. I normally would, but I've already accepted one or I've already got plans or I'm headed out of town or whatever the issue is. But if you're in a highly populated area, be prepared to take a PRN position um, if that's what you have to do. And that, that, that's what a lot of us have to do. I started in the Phoenix market and that's what I had to do. I took a PRN. I, I got a full time where I did my clinical at, but I also took a PRN at the other place I did my clinical slide at. Uh, where are we at? Let's see. So there's Sarah. So Darnell wants, a, wants markers or a Mosby's book to when you have to answer, ask that you are unable to answer within two minutes, but this can only be for students. To when you have to answer, ask that you are unable to answer. I have to run that by me again, but maybe it means ask a question and you have to answer within two minutes. So, yeah, no, I've, I've given away study guides. Darnell's talked about me doing another giveaway. I give away, uh, I'm Appleton Lane guy, I'll warn you. But I'll, I'll, what I do is give away like a $50 gift card to Amazon, and you can go buy whatever whatever it is you want. Um, so we'll work on that. What are the prerequisites, how long they take? Well, depends on your school. So that's a big, long discussion. But the short answer is if you go to public school, which is cheaper, like eight grand, they'll make you take all your prereqs first, which will take you a, a year or two, maybe three. Uh, private school will build those into the program most likely. Maybe some don't because there's a lot of them out there. But the one I went to, because I chose private over public, and there's articles and YouTube videos on my channel about why, um, I chose a private that was $18,000 instead of the public that was $6,000 because there was a three-year waiting list on this one. And this one I got in right away. Now, during that three years, you're working on your prerequisites. But this one, you get right in right away, and they build in the prerequisites into the course. So um, what are the prerequisites? It depends on whether you pick public or private um, and what and how long do they take. Again, it depends on what, what they want you to take. It's usually anatomy, physiology, biology, maybe some general math. Um that's about it. Cause you, and once you get into the course, you take your patient care and your physics and your um, positioning stuff like that. Uh, Sarah back to final studies. Thank you. Oh, another good cue. What tech, what tech do you use? Another good question. What tech do you use? Can watch seminars after. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Ask that again, Sarah, if you're not gone already. Um, what tech do you use? Maybe technique or 
Are there seminars that you can watch? I'm not sure. Um, moving on. Yeah, so Darnell's talking about the symposium. The RSNA, open to everybody. It's in Chicago. It's every year. This past year, they went virtual because everybody did. But the RSNA is a blast. And if any of you ever end up going, hit me up. I'll meet you there. It's awesome. Uh, but you got to wear, even if you're wearing suits, which most of us do, um, you got to take some tennis shoes because a week of wearing dress shoes. The first, in fact, I think I blogged about that. The first RSNA I went on, my feet were blistered. I had band-aids everywhere from all the walking. So wear your wear your tennis shoes, and you don't have to wear a suit. Um, and and well, you can't go to the HRA unless you join the HRA. But um, it's it's kind of cool to hear what's going on on the administration side, even if you're a tech, because you can kind of see what's coming down the pipeline, right? Um, let's see. Part rotation to win, a person has to ask you a question. If I can't answer within two minutes, then they win, but you can't Google the answer. Oh, no, you're talking about asking me, like, physics and stuff? No way, dude. I ain't doing that. My, I, I graduated in 2005, brother. There's no way. Uh, we'll figure something out, though. Uh, curious, was it wasn't hard for you to graduate. You know, <laughs> it wasn't hard for me to graduate because it was difficult. It was hard for me to graduate because um, – I, I pushed back a little bit on the school. So, I mean, if I, I call a spade a spade, if somebody's not being fair, I call it out. And I was being treated unfairly at my clinical site, one of my clinical sites, and I called it out. And I got in trouble because uh, I didn't call it out the right way. Um, and they actually threatened to pull me from my clinical site and I would be done. Uh, but, you know, whatever, it didn't happen. But I, I was at a clinical site. It was me and JoJo. I was talking about JoJo earlier. Me and JoJo were always having competency contests. Who can get the most? And uh, there was a supervisor at our clinical site that, I don't know if you like JoJo better or what. And JoJo's a pretty funny guy. But I would do a foot and JoJo would do a foot. And they would comp JoJo and tell me that I, I, I clipped some soft tissue at the end of the, the big toe or something, you know. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And this would happen over and over and over again. And so finally, something came up where we both had the same exact, exact exam. They comped off JoJo and told me no. And when that supervisor left for the day and another tech came up, I said, hey, what do you think about this foot? And they're like, looks good to me. I said, would you comp me on it? They're like, sure. Signed off. So I didn't turn it in to my school as a signed off competency. So technically, you know, I didn't present it as a signed off comp before – Somebody heard about it and went and tattled on me to the school and the school called me aside and said, we understand you went around your supervisor to get something comped off after they told you that you weren't comped. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'm proving my point that it's ridiculous that he won't do it and somebody else will. There needs to be some consistency here. Um, and they threatened to take away my clinical site, but they didn't because I never turned that in for credit. You know, I said, yeah, I've got it and I've kept it. And it's my proof that things aren't being treated fairly here. And so, you know, did I have a hard time graduating? No, because, uh, I mean, you study, you pass. Is it hard to pass the boards? Yeah. Is it nerve wracking? Yeah. But clinical rotations are all about getting along with everybody. There's nothing more irritating than shooting a chest x-ray at, you know, I don't know, 110 at 20 with a grid. And then somebody else comes along and goes, no, no, you should do 110 at, at 105 or 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 no, 110 at five, or, you know, they changed the KV by five or the mass by 10 or whatever. It's like, really, did that really make a difference? No, but they just, you know, either they're messing with you or they have their own certain ways. So that's what you have to learn in clinicals is don't wor worry about the fact that everybody has a different way to do everything. Just try to take note of what everybody's teaching you. And when you graduate and get your own license, you, you mix all that up and you and do it the way you want to do it. As long as you get a diagnostically significant image out of what you do, then it's acceptable. It doesn't have to be what Tom does or what Sally does. It's what you do, <clears throat> as long as it, as it works. So, no, I didn't have a hard time. I went back for ultrasound school and got through ultrasound school. Went to um, RPA school for a little bit until I lost my clinical site there. That's because the hospital got uh, bought out and closed. Um. Do we have to get an invite to the RSA? No, you just go. You just go. But it's like, you know, I don't know, a thousand bucks by the time you're done with it all. 
by the time you do room and board and a flight and the entry fee, um, it's not cheap, but it's kind of a write-off too because it's related to your work. You know, if you're playing the write-off game, if you write off your scrubs and your markers and and anything you do, your CEUs, anything related to what you do for a living, you could write that off. Um, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Did you enter the program without much knowledge? Um, mm, so I was a phlebotomist for 10 years before. I actually, when I went to Pima Medical Institute and I took the entrance exam for phlebotomy, it was the same exams and stuff for everything in their program. So I went for a phlebotomy to draw blood and they came back and said, you know, you, you qualify for a phlebotomy, but you also qualify for the x-ray program. Would you rather go into there? Because it makes more money. And I, I said, no, uh, my parents told me that if I had a bachelor's degree, that's the best thing I could do. So I was going to school at Arizona state to get my bachelor's at the time. So I said, no, I'd rather just be a phlebotomist. It's a three month class. I come out making like 12 bucks an hour bachelor's degree. And I did that <clears throat> for like 10 years and, uh, ended up going, I need more money and went back to that same school and took that, went to that x-ray program that they had offered me 10 years prior. Boy, if I had started it back then, it would be a whole other ball game right now. But um, So I went in already knowing medical terminology and knowing what the hospitals were like. And that was part of what helped me make my decision about radiography. Um, um, did I know anything else? I can't say I really knew any x-ray techs or... Oh, no. My stepdad went through the program right before me. So my stepdad graduated from the same program. And so I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it, right? And then I went through it. And then my wife went through the same one that I went through um, about two years after me. I was in my last semester of ultrasound school when she was in her first semester of x-ray. So, you know, to everybody that says I'm, I'm too busy, I, I have to work, I have kids, I have obligations, dude, we end up with six kids, and we were both in school at the same time, and I worked full time. So don't tell me that you can't get it done, because I got it done. So, um, so yeah, I knew healthcare before I, I got into the x-ray program, but not, not a lot about x-ray, but a lot about healthcare as a whole. Uh, I certainly didn't know about BEs. Nobody told me about those. So I was in the class, <clears throat> but I knew how to draw blood. That's what I did for a long time. So when it came time to stick an x-ray class, I already knew that. Um, what did you enjoy working better, ultrasound or x-ray? Oh, probably ultrasound. I really like ultrasound. Um and I talked about this the other day that there's, there's so much difference between the modalities. Like somebody said, what's the most stressful X-ray CT or, or MRI or something like that. So I kind of walked through them in, in X-ray, your stress comes from a little bit of turn and burn. Cause you got to hurry up if you got a busy, a busy place. And it's a little bit of stress because um, you may have somebody that's all balled up and you got to figure out how to do the forearm or something. You got to figure out how to, you know, lean them forward and angle your tube and, I liked x-ray because you got to think outside the box on how to capture the image, right? Because that was about manipulation of the body and the camera. Whereas CT, the stress is hurry up and don't get it wrong. Because if you have to do it again, it's going to suck. Because if you have a trauma patient who's intubated and all the doctors and nurses are in the room and you're scanning them and it's life-threatening and you screw it up and you got to do it again, everybody's staring at you. So CT is about hurry up, get it done, and get it done right, and don't screw up because you have to start it all over again. Um, but CT is very exciting as well. Uh, MRI is not turn and burn because you can't. It takes 30 minutes for most stuff, 45 to an hour uh, to get an MRI study done. And to me, the stress in there was, the, the, was the patient forthcoming in all of their surgeries are they coherent enough to remember that they've got buckshot in their back because their buddy shot them while they're out doing something? Um, do they have the right uh, device card? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Because if you put a patient on the table in MRI, there's a potential to injure them more so than any other modality. Um, so MRI is more stressful because you're worried about the safety of the patient and uh, them not being, maybe they don't even know, you know, who knows. 
Um, but that was the stress. And there's the stress of your, your two o'clock or your 10 o'clock came in at 10 15. So they're not quite late enough to tell them to get lost, but you, you, you figure out how to get them in. And then now you're behind the whole rest of the day and you got everybody complaining at you because you're behind. And that happens almost like every day in MRI. So the stress there is more about the schedule and patient safety CT, it's more about hurry up and get it done and don't screw up. And when you're sitting there like this and I'm looking at you're my scan monitor and that's my room and my patient out there and I'm doing my scan and hitting my injector and doing my thing, I could have 10 people literally lined up and they could be touching me. They could be right here breathing in my ear, be a doctor and a nurse and a, and a radiologist if you're lucky and a couple of ER nurses and whoever wants to gawk at what just came in. And sometimes you got to be like, gosh, you, you're going to have to back up off me because you're, you're starting to like impinge on my space. Uh, and they will because they, they want to see too. If, if this is where your scan is showing up, they want to look at it live while you're scanning it. And then they're like, what do you see? What do you see? In there? You see a stroke? What do you see in there? So that's the stress in CT, um, which is completely different than x-ray. So um, I enjoyed ultrasound because it's a little bit less stress. And it's tech dependent. You know, CT, if we're honest, you put the patient on the table. And as long as you scan them from the right two data points, you got everything. And ultrasound, if the ultrasound tech doesn't capture the image of a specific pathology, nobody's going to know it's there. So, if you know, if you're doing an ultrasound of the abdomen and you forget to do the gallbladder and that person had a gallstone that was causing problems, you're the reason that that didn't get diagnosed. Where if you CAT scanned them, you're going to get it all whether you tried to or not, Right. So ultrasound is very tech dependent, and I really enjoyed scanning babies. I enjoyed scanning pregnant moms and showing them the face and and look, it's waving at you and all that fun stuff. Of course, there's the the opposite when you have fetal demise or or an abnormality, and that sucks because you can't tell them because it's not your job. You're not allowed to tell them, uh, but it's really hard to condition yourself not to show it on your face when you see you know an abnormality. And sometimes you have to say, you know, I'll be right back. I got to get the doctor. Or you have to call, hey, I need you to come down and take a look. And they're like, what, what, what? And you, you can't say anything. You got to figure out how to nicely say, I just want to show the doctor this, this, you know, fourth uh, or this third arm or what, whatever it is. But um, I liked ultrasound. Plus, it's portable, which gave you the option to go to the patient's rooms if you wanted to, go to the ED to do your exams. Um, and you can do a mobile company. Uh, you can do ultrasound at the mall for gender, what do they call it, gender reveal. Not even have to have a license or anything. As long as you know how to use the ultrasound machine, you can open up a gender reveal. You go to people, they're going to people's parties now and doing gender reveals at, at parties. Um, and uh, 100 bucks, 150 bucks for a gender reveal. Uh, so I, I liked ultrasound. I liked them all. I, I, I did not enjoy MRI as much. Um, I didn't like being around the magnet that much. Uh, it made me feel just a little bit kind of, uh, unbalanced, kind of dizzy, if you will, after a full day out there. Um, and I just felt like if at any time I was tired or I wasn't, you know, I didn't have my head in the game and I could miss something that could seriously affect a patient. Whereas, you know, on a, on a CT scanner, there's no chance of, of them getting third degree burns on their face because I left a, a mask on their face because um, that, that's happening now. The, uh, the COVID uh, face masks are, are getting um, third degree burns on MRI patients. Um, UV tattoos. Have you seen the, the black lights? You can't see them unless there's a black light on it. They, they show up at a rave party and stuff. Um, you can't see them with the naked eye, so they don't feel any need to tell the MRI tech that they got it. Well, the ink in those UV tattoos has metallic content. So they get on the table and they start getting the MRI and they're like, hey, my, my arm's burning, my arm's burning. And come to find out they had a UV tattoo and they didn't want to tell anybody or they didn't think it was important. So I don't like that game uh, with MRI. Um, just didn't appeal to me. You get a lot better image in MRI. That's the nice thing. But it also takes you 45 minutes to acquire it. I'll take the five-minute CT that gives you most of what you need uh, and move on from there. Um, Darnell, do you think there will ever be a need for our, oh yeah, there's already a need for our age, brother, uh, badly. In fact, it just got approved because that was a question I got asked a couple months ago. It's approved now you can bill for them. So think about it. Think about, well, you may not know, but, uh, 
radiologists don't want to get out of their chairs. They want to sit in front of their screens, and that's where they make the most money. So let's say they make, uh, I don't know, 20 bucks reading an x-ray. You think, 20 bucks? That's not much. The, the guy can read an x-ray in two minutes. So, and then it goes up, you know, make it a hundred bucks for an MRI or whatever. They make their money by sitting because they've got templates. It's all, it's all on dragon speak. They'll be like uh, period paragraph, uh, normal chest X-ray uh, period, next paragraph. And it takes them like two minutes to dictate something. And they've got templates. If it's a normal chest X-ray, they can say uh, chest X-ray, normal, no variant. And that will pull up the entire template that says everything that you need to say about a normal x-ray. And that's all they had to say was one sentence to describe which template to use. And it pre-populates the whole thing. Boom. They're off to the next patient. So they don't want to get out of their chairs. So if they have to get out of their chairs to go do an IR procedure or a lumbar puncture or a small or a BE, you think a radiologist wants to be doing a BE or an esophagram, um, so these RRAs, these registered radiology assistants, are a mid-level provider. They are the PA or the nurse practitioner to the radiologists. The difference is, of course, RAs can't write prescriptions, and that's, that's a big holdback because if you can get a PA interested in being in radiology, they can be taught how to do lumbar punctures and small bowel follow-throughs and all that stuff. Plus, they can write prescriptions for the patient, and they can round on the patients if they're on the floors or whatever. And RA can't do that. So, fluoro that the radiologist doesn't want to do, um, and typically they're paid pretty well. I'd say they're they're probably pushing the six figures now. So, and the RA is a, a two-year program after X-ray school, just like uh, just like ultrasound school was. So it's not uh, it's not that difficult. It's a lot of fun actually. Um, which is harder to learn, ultrasound or x-ray? Ultrasound. Ultrasound is harder to learn because it's a black box. It's a, and if you look at ultrasound, if you don't know what you're looking at, it looks like a polar bear in a snowstorm, right? It looks like the TV when the channel goes off the air. It's just black and white thoughts. You have to learn what you're looking at, and only people that are trained on what they're looking at know what it is. So your patients have no clue what you're looking at. Um, x-ray, you know, kind of point and click you know you, you got a hand so you put it out there and you, you shoot it and then you always have to have two different angles so you you do your lateral then you, you do your oblique um as long as your light field is outside of that spot and you shoot it at the right technique and now that it's automated uh you don't really have to do too much with your techniques um x-ray is not too difficult when compared to some of the other modalities uh the difficulty in x-ray is that you got to cover the entire hospital you got to be able to go to the or and run the c arm or the o arm you got to be able to go to the ICU and do a chest X-ray on an intubated patient with 15 lines coming off of them. You got to go to the NICU and do a, a, a chabdomen or a pediatric chest X-ray on an infant with lines coming out of them. Um, you got to be able to go to ER and do traumas. So you got to be able to take walkie-talkies from the outside. Uh, you got to be able to do fluoro studies. I mean, there's so many things that the general X-ray technologist does. That's why it rubs us wrong and we don't get the respect we deserve because we cover everything, everywhere. Um, usually, like, even nursing, you're an ICU nurse, or you're an emergency room nurse, or you're a med floor nurse. You're not a cover the whole hospital nurse, right? You're not a five different areas with five different types of equipment nurse. Uh, X-ray techs are invaluable, and that's why uh, I'm really interested in that strike in Chicago uh, that includes X-ray techs, because... I don't know if you guys saw the article about the, the tech in Kansas who they made a big deal about because he slept in his RV for a week in the parking lot because if he didn't, the hospital would have shut down because he was the only x-ray tech left that didn't have COVID. Well, what they don't tell you is there's only three techs total because it's a really small hospital. And that guy usually sleeps out there in the RV one week in a month because he takes call there. So it wasn't a huge deal, but the point it proved is without x-ray, they don't exist. Hospitals can't run without x-ray. So, and that's what everybody, you guys all need to remember that when you're getting grief, you know, when you're, when your administration is telling you, you don't get a raise or you get an evaluation that doesn't give you that extra 10 cents or whatever. Yeah. Let's, let's see you guys run this department without your x-ray tax and see how that goes. But um, it's always easier to say than do, right? Uh, so yes, definitely need the RAs. Um, harder to learn ultrasound. 
Um, do you think, um, hi, D, by the way, <clears throat> do you think in 10 to 15 years, x-ray technology will be outdated? Will this career be sustainable? Totally sustainable. Already have those conversations. I'm at the conferences. If you missed it earlier, I'm at the conferences where we review all the AI. It was, two, it was 2018, I believe, at the RSNA when 50% of the demonstration floor was AI. And we all went, holy crap, they're serious about this stuff. It's like half of the vendors are pushing something AI. And that was the year we all went, okay, we better start getting our hands around this. And that's when the radiologists start freaking out. Uh, they're trying to take our jobs. Well, maybe. Um, so what's going to happen is, and, and you're already seeing it if, if you're in the field. I don't, I don't know if you're in the field or not. But um, – so AI is part of the, uh, you know, the x-ray equipment. If you've seen the x-ray equipment that you, you can tell I'm going to do a chest x-ray. You push a button and the tube moves through the room and the wall bucky comes up and they line up on each other. And you, you, all you did was push chest x-ray and then you walked, you got your patient and put them in front of the tube and it was all prepared for you. That's AI. Now on the other side, on the reading side, they've taught AI, they've given it, you know, Images are, are black and white, right? 256 colors, shades of gray, if you will. And you can give a computer a chest x-ray that's nothing but shades of gray. Give them a normal chest x-ray. It'll memorize it. Then you can give them one with situs inversus or something. And they'll scan and go, well, wait a minute, this does not match this one. And, and it'll highlight an area that's wrong. So it'll, it'll highlight the heart shadows on the other side and call it out. So they've already got it to where AI is, at, is uh, reading chest x-rays. What you have to remember is they'll never replace completely because somebody's got to double check. If, if you ever if you ever put out an AI generated radiology report and it was wrong, you are in so much trouble. So a uh, human is always going to have to overread that. So that's what saves the radiologist. Plus, there's some stuff that's so complicated. They're nowhere near. They just got chest x-rays. Now they're working on breast mammograms um, or mammograms. <laughs> they're all breast mammograms. Um, where are we at? So even though these machines may be getting super smart and can go to – we saw this coming years ago. I don't know if you noticed, but years ago, 10 years ago, if you went to McDonald's and you said, I want a hamburger, a large fry, and a small Coke, they had the word Coke and then the word small, medium, large. They had to read the words. Now if you go there, it's a picture – of a small Coke and a picture of a medium Coke and a picture of a large Coke. So they don't have to read anymore. They just have to see the image. That's what our x-ray machines are doing now. If you need a foot, you push the foot image. You don't look for the word foot. You don't, you don't click on the word extremity and scroll down and click on the word foot. You just click on images of body parts. So they're dumbing it all down already, but they're still going to have to have somebody who can run the machine. So, so let's go out on a limb and let's say that you can, you can tell the patient somehow, uh, all you got to do is go stand against that wall right there and put your back right where that X is. And then the, you tell the machine chest X-ray and it moves all around and it lines up and it sits there. It will even get to the point where it's going to be able to detect how much technique to use because we're already there. But if there's any variant to that patient, if they're, if they're scoliotic or kyphotic or, you know, whatever, uh, that machine's not going to be able to differentiate that until it's already, it, it may shoot the image and go, oh, we can now see that the spine is kind of curvy. Maybe we should do another image and ask the patient to rotate. But then you start, how are you going to ask the patient to rotate through a machine? There's always going to be that human factor that has to position the patient properly, evaluate the outcome of the image and determine if another one needs to be done or not. So there's always going to be a need. Now, couple onto that. Um, D or D couple onto that, that the baby boomers are right in the middle of retirement. The baby boomers are now in that 60, 70, 80 year range and they're flooding the hospitals. That's our biggest generation in America, right? The baby boomers. And now they're crushing the hospital systems because we don't have people to keep up with how, how much they're inundating us. So, we can't graduate students fast enough to keep up with the rising rate. In fact, here in little old Podunk, Idaho, about four years ago, we did a study and found that in the next 10 years, 
we were going to see 40% more Medicare patients over those 10 years because of this incoming baby boomer uh, generation. So in management, we have to start getting ahead of that. That means I got to buy an extra MRI scanner. I got to buy two more CT scanners. I need three more x-ray rooms. I need to build an outpatient clinic on that side of town and on that side of town. And then other departments have to start figuring out who's going to drive the bus to go get them and all that stuff. So um, no, don't worry about x-ray as a career going away. And if you want to, to solidify yourself even stronger, it's going to be learning multiple modalities. Um, because the more modalities you learn, the more valuable you are. Um, but I'll always give a little extra piece of advice that, and I learned this from my friend Scott Berry. You should always, because uh, we talk about redundancy. Redundancy, it's an old military thing. Three is two, two is one, one is none. That means if you only have one of something and it breaks, you got none. Uh, if you have two of something and one breaks, you still have one, but then you only have one and if it breaks, you're out. So you always want to have backup to your backup to your backup. So if I said to him one time, because he, he was a cop when I met him and, and he was interested in radiology. And I said, why would you, what, you get shot at too much? Why do you want to come over here? And he said, because I need two completely different credentials. I need my hand or my foot in two different worlds. So that if one collapses, I still got a way to provide a living. And I thought, well, I, I said, well, I got that covered, man. I got an x-ray license and a CT license. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. You're still in healthcare." So if healthcare collapses, you're screwed. And I thought, well, how is that ever going to COVID? COVID laid all of us off. You either got laid off or you got sent home and told to use your own PTO to pay your salary. Never thought that would have happened in a million years. So I stepped out now to, to start another career in a whole other non-health related aspect, just in case I can't keep it going in, in the radiology world. So I'll tell you to make yourself more valuable in the radiology world by getting multiple modalities. But always remember that you're still in the healthcare bubble. And whenever that healthcare bubble pops, you need something on the side, whether it's a skill from home, teaching piano lessons out of your house, or foreign language lessons, or mowing yards, fixing lawnmowers, whatever it is. Always have a secondary skill to keep things going just in case, no matter what you do. So, um, yeah, where do we go with that one? Technology's not going. Technology's not going anywhere. The other thing we're gonna have to watch for, you know, you're worried about jobs. Since we can't hire enough because there's not enough students being populated right now, um, one of the things Siemens has already done. Siemens has a MRI scanner, a console. A picture that I'm holding my keyboard and I'm doing an MRI. I'm an MRI tech, and I can sit at that console looking through my window at my MRI patient over there, but I also have a computer keyboard right here and a computer keyboard right here and I can control through the cameras an MRI if I'm sitting here in Phoenix I can do an MRI in Texas and I can do an MRI in Florida and all you need at those other locations is a healthcare person who's competent enough to put a patient on the table and take them off the table competent enough to tell them exactly where to lay on the table so you can get a good study while the person doing the study is remotely located in one location and running three scans in three different states. Siemens already has that. So as we continue to struggle to hire enough techs, the vendors are taking the next step and coming out going, well, we'll help you solve that problem. You'll only need one MRI tech to sit at that console and run three scanners. But you got to be super comfortable with the liability you're taking on if something goes wrong in that other state. So where this might come in is an outpatient like a Simon Med or one of those outpatient uh, imaging centers. All they do is outpatient stuff. They're not, not a hospital, not an urgent care. It's just an imaging hub. If they have multiple, it could even be in the same town. You have three locations all around Phoenix. You can have one guy in one place running three scanners. And all you got to do is hire some uh, CNAs or uh, medical assistants to put your patients on the table. Um, but again, you got to be really careful because they have to be screened appropriately. They screw up. Somebody gets burned or whatever. Big, big trouble. But I'm just telling you that because you want to make yourself as, as um, valuable as possible because you never know what's going to happen in each modality. And the more um, valuable you are, the more modalities you can do, the more, the more money you make because they should pay you at the highest rate. 
Uh, but some don't. Some say whatever you work in that. If you're an ultrasound tech and you work a day, a shift, a full shift in x-ray, you're only getting x-ray pay, which is crap. You're an ultrasound tech helping them run their x-ray department. They wouldn't be running that thing if you weren't over there helping them. They should still pay you ultrasound pay to be in there. I would fight that, but it's up to you. Uh, pay is pretty good. Yep. For RH you're talking about. And then Detective Awesome's on board. Even though I sound scary for us at the end of the day, whatever is best for the patient has to be done. Yeah, I mean, AI is just making it all better. And then, there, you know, we, we complain about all these new regulations like appropriate use criteria. That's a new mandate that says doctors can no longer order an advanced modality exam uh, without verifying why they're ordering it. In other words, in the software, they're putting in uh, MRI of the brain, and if their symptom is headache, let's see, is that one of them? If the symptom is, let's say the symptom is headache, this thing's going to red banner flash and boop, boop, boop. Are you sure an MRI is the best way to go initially? Should you consider one of these options? And it'll say, you know, CT or whatever. And what it's doing is it's trying to keep the doctor from spending too much money right from the get-go. It's, it's appropriate use criteria. It, it wants to flag well, it's two things. Are you doing the wrong thing? Because there are doctors that order the wrong thing all the time. But it's also trying to cut back on costs. Because if, if you could get by with a $1,500 CT instead of a $2,500 MRI, they would rather, insurance companies and whatnot, would rather you do the $1,500 one. So since CMS and everybody's tied to patient reimbursement or, uh, yeah, reimbursement um, of, of duties, then they want you to only, you know, only order an x-ray if that's what you need. Don't skip x-ray and go straight to CT. Don't skip CT and go straight to MRI. Appropriate use means doing. And so there's this software now that's supposed to make them start getting serious about what they order, but they keep kicking the can down the road. Oh, uh, too many of you are complaining that you're not ready for it yet, so we'll start it next year. And then we'll start it next year. So as far as I know, we're, they're still kicking the can, and we were supposed to start it two years ago. So AI and things like that are there to help us provide better care, like Detective Awesome is saying. Um, and it's never going to replace us. Uh, where it'll cause you trouble is if you don't learn it, if you don't catch up to it, if you are too stuck in the way you used to do it. Um, I had to learn when I was learning CT, I had to learn from a traveler how to do an automatic ROI for a PE study. Because the guy training me always manually timed it. He said, oh, I, I manually time it at 12 seconds or whatever it was. And I always do that. And I always get it. Uh, and maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But if the if this computer will do it automatically based on an ROI dot, why wouldn't you do it that way? Because you're guaranteed to hit it every time then. So you have to be willing to learn the new, the new software, the new data, the new whatever is the latest and greatest. Um, because if you don't, then your management may be like, you know, you're, you're still asking how to do these things on, on Epic. And we went live a year ago, you know, so there's that. Um, yeah. The cop, uh, that guy, he and I are still real good friends. He's the one we used to go comp shopping a lot with. I actually, I started with Jojo when we were students, but um, Scott and I used to, ER all the time. If he needed a mandible, we'd go look at all the patients and go, oh, there's two that were in a fight. Let's go talk to them. Hey, Doc, you got two fights down there. Any chance either one of them might need a mandible? And, and uh, you know, if they did, logically, then he would do that. If they didn't, he wouldn't order it just to appease us. But there are some times when, you know, maybe they needed one maybe they needed one thing and, and you could morph it into something else that still showed the detail of that region or something like that. But, um, yeah, he's... Uh, he went from being a cop to uh, x-ray CT, and he was trying to do ultrasound for a little while, but I don't think he ever went uh, fully that way. Um, one more. Do you think a PACS administrator can easily transition to the IT field if the medical field Armageddon comes? Um, yeah, totally, yeah. So um, PACS administrator is another great career choice for um, techs. Because who would you rather have as your PACS administrator, uh, a computer nerd with, you know, no idea what we do in the radiology world or a, a rad tech? One of the best um, PACS admins I ever had was uh, a CT tech because she knew exactly what we were talking about. 
Um, but pack, being a pack that man, it's not that hard, brother. You know, you got to know the software, you got to know the server, you got to know the HL7, and you got to know kind of how it all works. I threw mine for a loop one time when I went to 3D Breast Homo from regular uh, memography because 3D Breast Homo saves images in a cine loop, like, a, a, like an MPEG, like a movie file instead of a static ping or JPEG. Um, and when I switched it over, he didn't, didn't realize that, I guess. Maybe I didn't tell him. Uh, and he ran out of storage space fast because all of a sudden you went from storing static JPEG or DICOM uh, uh, mammogram x-rays to storing video cine loops, uh, and it filled up the server quick. And so we had to upgrade everything, and, and the rads were pissed because it was taking a while for everything to come over, and you have to figure out, you know, you have to, we had to upgrade to, gosh, I don't even remember what it was, something we didn't even have in town yet. It, we got some kind of a T1 line or something. I can't remember it at the time. It was a new thing. We had to get faster speed because the rads have to load previous exams and the current exam do comparisons. So anyway, a PACS administrator pays good. You get close to six figures with that, depending on the size of your hospital. And it's really just managing the information that we already work with as a tech, right? It's making sure that images go to the right place and they have the right names attached to them and, and that they're uh, able to be recalled and they're stored for the accurate amount of time, depending on the loss. And um, I, I, you know, maybe I'm looking at it a little too uh, broad scope, but PAX admin isn't that hard. Is it, is it a pain in the butt? Yeah, because you got people that don't know what they're doing calling you. Imagine being on an IT desk and people are calling you all the time. Uh, I can't get my mouse to work, you know, or whatever. The rats will call. My dragon speak isn't working. Uh, or, you know, I had one rat that always have like 50 tabs. He would read a study and then open a new tab for the next study. And then he'd read that study and then he'd open a new. So, he'd have, so pretty soon his computer system would lock up because he'd have all these studies open. He'd be like, I don't understand why my computer keeps locking up. Dude, seriously? So, um, you know, there's different <laughs> different stresses on the IT side. But, no, you can totally segue out of PAX IT into uh, any IT that you want. And you can always take those side classes, too. Get Cisco certified or, or Microsoft certified or whatever on the side while you're a PAX administrator. Uh, plus, they have their own cool little um, – oh, what's it called? We have the RSNA. They have their own little two, two – um, conventions a year that the IT guys go to that are really cool that I, I've always wanted to go to myself. Uh, one's more for PAX administrators and one's more for IT as a whole. Uh, but it's re really, I always get great reports back from those. Um, so, yeah, the only, you know, the medical field Armageddon, I think I've pretty much seen it all at this point. Uh, maybe I'm being naive, but I've seen it where we have too many techs and not enough techs. And I've seen it where we have too many schools and not enough schools. I've seen the hospitals where they're ran by MBAs who don't know the first thing about patient care to the hospitals ran by hospitals who know all about patient care, but not how to make a dollar. Um, and now I've seen a pandemic uh, catch a country off guard. And um, there was a lot of people that didn't know what to do with that. Uh, and administrators, uh, you know, I don't know. Gosh, there's going to be so much come out of this when it's over that we could have done better. Um, but I think one way to stay safe in it is is do your multi modalities. I mean, my wife never multi She's just been x-ray for 10 years, something like that. Um, she doesn't want to learn anything else. She's fine with a part-time. The nice thing about part-time, if you can do part-time, if you're not required to work full-time, is you can always flex it up. So they're always calling her, asking her to pick up extra shifts. And she can do it if she wants, or she can not do it. Um, she's got herself in. She just got off 12s. She had set up where she did two 12s a, a week, got her 24 hours, five days off a week. She enjoyed it, but in the long run, it ate into the evenings where the kids had ball games. So now she's, she's waited until a position came open, and now she does uh, – she does this weird split. I was talking the other day about these weird split schedules, like seven on, seven off, and that kind of stuff. She's on this thing now, or she's on eights, but she does uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, one week, and then Monday, Tuesday, the next. 
So it's kind of like a five on, five off, if you want to call it that. But you have the weekend off right in the middle. So it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. And then I think you're off until the following week. And then, I don't know, it, it rotates. It's weird. I can't keep track of it. But she likes it, and it's part-time, and it keeps her skills up. And uh, she's making good money for, you know, for an X-ray tech. So um, if that's it for the questions, I'd say that was a pretty good session. I only intended to talk for an hour during lunch, and we went two hours. Um, got seven thumbs up. Is there any final questions before I log off? About 15 till three out here. We got a ton of snow. Wish I could take the camera outside and show you guys. I went out 5.30 this morning, clearing off the cars. I, I just stuck my hand inside my coat sleeve and just arm barred the whole windshield all the way down the hood, down um, the car. So, I mean, there must have been that much snow all the way around on the cars. So I cleared them all off. For, I've got six daughters, if you haven't heard me say that. So I, I cleared a couple of daughters' cars off, my wife's, mine. Started them up, got them warmed up. I, I love the snow, but I don't love the snow. You know what I mean? It's nice every now and then. It's nice for Christmas. Give me a white Christmas, maybe a week before, a week after, and then bring the sun back on because you can do so much more uh, outside when it's nice and warm. So, Dean, you're welcome. Thanks for stopping by. I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to do this a couple times a week. Unfortunately, I just can't give much advance notice. Um, so I'll go on my Facebook group and I'll post when I'm live and I'll try to do it for a minimum of an hour. So if you're, if you're on the Facebook group and you set it to notify you when things are posted or whatever, I'll post it there. And then I, I kind of want to start doing Saturday mornings or Sunday evenings consistently, but there's just always something going on that kind of gets in the way of it. And if there's ever anybody home, cause I got like the house all to myself today. If there's ever anybody home, it's it's a crapshoot because ultimately this is the other bathroom in the house. I and mean, you got six girls, uh, you never they're gonna be in this thing 50 times a day. So um, when I have the house to myself, it's really easy to pop on and do a one hour or two hour with no interruptions. It's, it's really enjoyable, actually. So thanks everybody for stopping by and hope you have an enjoyable rest of the week. I'll see you over on the Facebook uh, group. And again, if you if you have anything you want me to check out, a resume or an essay or whatever, shoot me an email. I'll look over that and um, go from there. See you guys.